Kern Conweiser is a writer, director, producer of award-winning movies, documentaries, TV movies and series, new media, live events, and dance. He's a tap dancer. So I want you to just kind of get some of the people he works with and hangs out with. Just a few names. Oliver Stone, Carlos Santana, Quincy Jones, Lawrence Fishburne, etc. Okay? Um, I don't know how many of you know this, but we host, when we decide who we're going to host for, uh, Adrian gives us a whole packet of information about a person. And from this packet, we go through and we write the introduction that we give each week. It's not something we're handed. So I got to tell you, I've had a real problem this week because every paragraph is another movie, another project, another award. It's been really amazing. So I'm going to just hit a few highlights because there's just too much to say about Kern. Um, <clears throat> he's written a script for Oliver Stone called Escobar, and that's going to be st starting to be a movie filmed in, uh, in Puerto Rico. He directed a lifetime television movie called Island Heat, Stranded. He's uh, co-directed Shanghai Kiss. Um, the, he's um, wrote, produced, and directed a performance documentary, Underground Poets Railroad, which is really about hip-hop. Um, the Last Game. Um, okay, now, these two are really big. One's called Unhallowed Ground, and it's um, about sports. And so he won the Sports Emmy Award for Best Documentary in 2000. And uh, the, the one that, I guess, stands out to me, because I've seen it, and it's wonderful, Miss Evers Boys. Um, and it was a uh, HBO feature film that won five Emmys, including Best Picture. So I, I expected Kern to be kind of an older guy. He's a young guy. He has two children, um, a six-year-old boy and a three-year-old daughter. Um, he got his bachelor's at Cornell and his MFA, Master of Fine Arts, at USC School of Cinema and Television and for screenwriting. I am so pleased to be able to bring up to this audience to talk about his movie that's in the film festival, Kern Conweiser. Thank you so much for having me here. Really appreciate it. It's really an honor to, to be here. And um, I'm, just, I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to share this film in particular of all the movies that um, I've had the opportunity to work on. I just feel like, you know, right now I'm holding on to something that is, in my mind, sort of a national treasure for what it has within it, uh, the voices of these young American soldiers. Uh, and you know, the real challenge with documentaries is you can spend an awful lot of time and energy crafting a story that you really deeply believe in, and uh, it's, then it kind of goes away, you know, and nobody sees it. And people go, oh, how can I find it? And you go, well, I have to send it to you. And you, you have these kinds of things, and you think, wow, you know, all that effort, and, and you know, and then it goes, boop, and kind of disappears. Um, so much of the effort that goes into making a movie is actually the effort of getting the movie out to an audience after you finish making the movie. Something that a lot of independent filmmakers don't really, you know, not aware of until they have the experience. Um, so being here, being able to share the movie with you guys, um, for you to then turn around, if you're so inspired, to say to other people, I saw something really extraordinary, you should go find this, or you should go see it at the festival. This is really what it's all about, so thank you for that opportunity. Um, so, um, let's see. I'll start with a little bit of background on, on myself. Um, hang on, do a quick adjustment here. This guy go down. Oh, you know, it's all right. You guys can hear me okay? Everything's all right? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and then I end up, you know, not knowing how to do that. Oh, thank you very much. Perfect, thanks. Much better, thanks. Um, so, uh, uh, I work with my brother, Kip. Um, so if I'm saying we a lot, I'm not trying to sound 
like I'm talking about myself like the royal we. It's actually me and my brother. Uh, and um, we grew up in Newport Beach and uh, uh, lived in Irvine Terrace for many, many years and uh, went to Harbor Day School and delivered the Daily Pilot, taught tap dance classes at Jimmy DeFord Dance Center and all these kinds of things. So um, I obviously have a real affinity for, for being down here. I live in Los Angeles now. Um, and, uh, and a real affinity for the film festival. Uh, this will be our fourth film that we've had in the Newport Beach Film Festival, and it always feels like a homecoming to be able to come back here. Um, when my brother and I were kids, we used to sit on a bluff down the street from our house looking out over the uh, Newport Harbor and trying to figure out when the heck were we going to do with our lives. Uh, our parents afforded us a sterling education, and what were we, how were we going to put it to use? Um, you know, we really loved tap dancing, but that didn't seem like the right thing to do for a living um, with an Ivy League degree and, you know, 16 years of private education. Uh, but we knew we wanted to do something together, and we knew we wanted to do something creative. And um, a friend put a film camera in our hands that summer when I was, I guess, 12 or 13. My brother was 17. And uh, we felt like we found the thing that we wanted to do. Um, and that summer, when we were teenagers, we would sit on that bluff and we would map out how it was that we were going to do this for a living. Uh, and you know, Kern's going to do the creative and Kip's going to do the business and we're going to work side by side and we're going to make sure that creative and business are always parallel in their significance and their importance and that business isn't keel hauling creative along like so often happens. That we were going to learn every aspect of this business so that between the two of us, we could do it all, and we could, you know, like Butch and Sundance, you know, side by side, and we were going to take on the whole Mexican army. Um, that's pretty much actually how it went. Uh, I, I, I'm still kind of startled, you know, 20-something years into this now, uh, how accurate we were in our assessment of what the challenges would be and what we would need to do as brothers to uh, look out for each other in a hyper-competitive and rather unscrupulous industry. Um, so... You know, we, we watch each other's back. Um, but that was where the, you know, where the dream was born. It was born right here in Newport Beach. Uh, so I thought that was worth sharing with you guys. Um, and, uh, and the dynamic of our, of our partnership is still really works that way. I, I, for the most part, handle the creative matters. And my brother, for the most part, handles the business matters. Um, and there's really is no barrier between us, so frequently we'll share credits. So there'll be movies that we do that are written, produced, directed, edited, and composed by Kip and Kern. Uh, and we even say Kip and Kern because we like to stick our names together. Um, uh, and so I've I've directed a a, a lot of documentaries. Um, directed a, a lot of I've worked on a lot of different kinds of movies. Um, being an independent filmmaker sort of necessitates that you know you eat what you kill. So. Uh, you, you do a lot of different things. Um, but the documentaries were always really where I um, uh, kind of felt like I found my home. Um, I've directed about probably close to a dozen of them now. Um, and, uh, but Baker Boys was a different situation. Now I'm going to start getting off of me and into the movie. Um, with Baker Boys, the footage was shot entirely by one man uh, in Iraq, um, a uh, war cinematographer named John Steele, who for 35 years did nothing but go into uh, the worst combat and crisis zones in the world um, and record what was happening there, uh, right smack in the middle of everything. Uh, there ha isn't a single place in this world that's suffered that John hasn't been and got it with his camera. Uh, and he did this for a news agency called ITN uh, out of the UK. Um, so this was a unique situation for me, coming into a project where I did not go and shoot all of this footage, but what came back was 140 hours from a thoroughly exhausted man uh, who didn't really have the, you know, the legs to run it all the way to the finish line and put it through post. And I think he'd also become very tight and close to the story, and it was hard for him to step back and see the, the bigger picture of it all. Um, the company that I work at now, Gigapix Studios, um, was a, a co-financer of this documentary, had paid for John to go to Iraq and get this footage. Uh, and at the time that I came into the company, there was this documentary that was meandering around, lost in editing. Uh, and everybody knew they had something, but nobody knew what it was and how to put it together. Uh, and I got the opportunity to be that guy. Um, and I threw myself into this with everything I had. Uh, so it's a, 
you know, I feel like even though I have the director credit in this movie, and I actually at one point at the end of the movie, I tried to, to share it with John Steele and say it's weird for me to take the director credit, sole credit on this movie when you're the one who went and risked your life and did all of this. Um, and, uh, you know, John in his self-deprecating way said, this is your credit, you know, and I want written and, and shot by John Steele. And if it says that, I'm happy. Um, so I have a sole director credit, but this one is really different. I feel like my credit should be Shepard, you know. Um, it's about getting John's uh, work and his message, well, not his message because he didn't have a message, getting John's work out to as many people as could possibly see it, to put it into form and a shape where it could stand on its own uh, and, he, and John would look at it and go, yeah, that's, that's what happened, that's the story. Um, so I've been a shepherd on this movie. Um, in many ways, the shepherding is being like a, kind of like a, what a production executive would do. Um, you know, overseeing the project, making sure that sort of clearing the brush out of the way for the path that we know we're going to be going down. I spend a lot of my energy on this movie, um, uh, you know, trying to get it reviewed and trying to get into festivals and looking for its distribution and selling territories and the UK and France and Germany and, uh, you know, doing multiple cuts of the movie so we have different formats that can go in different places. All of this stuff is a full-time job that can last like a full year. And it doesn't even, that job doesn't even start until the movie's finished. Um, so again, going back to this point that making a movie is a, a really long-term process, especially these documentaries. You know, there's the year or more that's spent making it and the year or more that's spent getting it out into the marketplace. Um, and one of the things that happens a lot and will happen with a lot of the movies at the Newport Beach Film Festival and with every film festival uh, is, you know, people knock themselves silly to make this movie. They leverage every dime that they have and all of their parents' money and their friends' parents' money. Uh, and they get the movie done and then they pray that some distributor will come and pick it up. Um, and we live in a, a really uncertain and difficult time where that distributor coming to pick up the movie is happening with less and less frequency uh, and picking up those movies f for fewer and fewer dollars. Um, and, you know, independent filmmakers need to be aware that they gotta save a little bit, of, keep a little gunpowder dry, uh, keep a little bit of your energy intact so that when your movie is done, you can do the things that I'm now doing with Baker Boys uh, and have the sustained effort of putting it out there and getting it in front of the people who are going to recognize it for what it is and help, you know, perpetuate it. Um, so a kind of a unique situation for me on this film as a director. Um, so, you know, what I really want to do is kind of set up what this movie, how this movie came about, um, you know, what it contains, uh, and then show a, a brief clip of it and try to get as quickly as possible into Q&A with you guys, because I have a feeling that you're going to want to talk about the content in this movie. Uh, then again, if what you guys are really interested in is about the filmmaking process, or anything from my background, or you know anything under the sun, I'm open to all of it. But I, I want to really try to get to the meat of the movie so that uh, you guys can sort of start sinking your teeth into that. Um, so. So here's the setup for, for how John Steele got to Iraq to shoot this movie. So as I mentioned, for 35 years, this is what John did uh, for ITN, the news uh, network. And he actually was, a, he was the pool videographer. So he would shoot the footage, it would go to the UK, and then it would go out to all the news organizations that would use his footage. Um, he was in Iraq six months before the war started, uh, working on trying to get an exclusive interview with Saddam Hussein. So he had a, a unique perspective on the lead up to the war. Uh, and he, he disagreed with it profoundly, uh, with the, not, not just the war per se, but with the way that the media was, uh, he felt, complicit in the lead up to the war. That uh, they were running with Bush talking points because they fell in love with the story of the fall of Saddam. And they weren't seeing the bigger picture or doing their, the investigative work that uh, he felt needed to be done, uh, that they were, were just sort of running with the story because it was a great story. And they all wanted to have that story. Uh, and when John would protest uh, his news organization, uh, they would get very upset with him. Uh, and so finally, uh, the day before the bombing started in Iraq, he put his camera down and he quit after 35 years. And he walked away from you know, a war that, by all otherwise purposes, he would be there documenting. Um, he went and basically hid 
for five years uh, in the south of France. Um, no internet, um, no TV, um, no news to speak of. Uh, he wrote a novel, he drank a lot of wine. Uh, and <laughs> five years later he looked up and kind of expected that the war would be long done uh, and kind of, you know, to see what was going on and was uh, surprised not just to see that the war was still happening, but what really struck him was all of these Americans coming back home with all of these uh, uh, mental injuries, um, suffering from PTSD. As a, a combat videographer, he was very familiar with what PTSD is. He's suffered from it for decades. Um, he's probably seen more combat than anybody who's served in Iraq. Uh, and uh, he felt that the, these young men and women, their story was not being told, or even more to the point that they weren't getting the opportunity to tell their story. Uh, and so he decided he was going to go back to Iraq um, to uh, point the camera at the soldiers and to ask them, how do you feel? What are you thinking? So he put in his request to the army to embed. And he said, I'm going back. I'm going with no media affiliation. No new, I'm not working for anybody. This is a guy named John with a camera. And I'm going by myself. Uh, and I want to ask these questions. Um, to the army's credit, and they get a lot of credit for uh, allowing this film to get made and uh, really being so hands-off on the creative content of the movie. Um, there was somebody uh, at the public affairs office who felt that, um, you know, even if these soldiers are gonna say things that are gonna uh, make us blanch, um, after this many years in Iraq, they deserve the opportunity to say it. And so uh, he gave John permission to embed and he put him with Baker Company of the uh, 115 Infantry, uh, an elite combat unit that had been there from the very, very beginning. These are the guys who rolled into Baghdad in the very start of the war. Um, many of them on their third and fourth rotations in Iraq. Um, they were at the end of a 12-month deployment, uh, and this is right at the time that the surge was being implemented. And these men were told, good news, you're staying for another three months, uh, and we're sending you, <clears throat> sending you to uh, 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 Al-Qaeda hotbed south of Baghdad, and we have a new mission now. Uh, it's a counterinsurgency that we're going to fight going forward from here. Um, and that was the day that John joined, was the day that Baker Company left to begin this new mission. And it was really fortuitous timing that he was there at this really clear turn in the war of, and the way that our approach to the war. So what John captured in his camera, and, I, and I'm going to show you a, a substantial element of this part of the movie, uh, is what a counterinsurgency looks like. Because we all read about the surge, and we all heard about it, and it was beaten over us like crazy during the presidential election about the surge worked, the surge worked. But what was the surge? What happened over there that worked? And what we started, what John un uncovered is that it wasn't just about more bodies, it was about entirely different tactics. Uh, and tactics that uh, have a lot of moral ambiguity to them as to what kind of a war are we fighting if we're going to fight it this way? Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. We'll come back to this afterwards, and maybe we'll talk about this a bit. I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Um, uh, so the counterinsurgency was the one thing that was really extraordinary about what John got, and uh, that I don't think anybody else has captured on film. The other thing that's unique to this movie is uh, John spent 90 days embedded with Baker Company. Uh, that's the longest embedment of anybody with a camera in the history of the war by many times. I mean, most people go for two, three days, maybe two, three weeks. Uh, if they're covering a story over the course of a year, they'll go in and out over the course of that year. John went to this forward operating uh, base that was just a big field when they first got there um, with bombed out buildings in it. And he stayed for 90 days at that field with the army as they raised up this post and did their mission every single day until the day they came home. He was, went on every mission. He was the first one out of the vehicle with his camera. Uh, and he did everything he could possibly do to show these guys that he was not just another reporter who was there to film them getting shot so that he could you know, display it on, and get what, uh, what the news organizations wanted to show. Um, but that he was there again to ask them, how do you feel? What are you thinking? So he did his interviews at the end of those 90 days. And by the time that those interviews started, these guys were so close with John that he was not a journalist. He was one of them, um, which is saying a lot because you know, one of them means 
you've run that gauntlet, uh, and you know you're now a member of a family. Um, and because he was so familiar with combat, um, he knew which questions to ask. And so he did interviews with about 45 guys from the lowest grunty grunt who has to you know burn poop for his duty all the way up to the commanding officer who's in charge of 350 men and the mission at large. Uh, and he asked them all the same 20 questions. So, well, and all in the same environment too. You'll see all the interviews in front of this amazing cracked wall that just sort of represents Iraq. In fact, it looks like Iraq. It looks like the Tigris River going down. Um, and uh, so he got you know, these, these different opinions and perspectives on the same core issues. Um, you know, what are you gonna tell people when you go home and they ask you, what was it like? Um, tell me about the importance of laughter in Iraq. Um, tell me about waking up day after day in Iraq. What's the personal cost that you have given for being here? Um, you know, these kinds of questions. Questions that dig under the skin. And these soldiers were so honest with him um, and just laid their emotions bare in front of his camera, saying things to John while the camera's rolling that I'm certain that they have not told their own families, maybe probably told their psychologists, um, but they would tell John with the camera rolling because they felt a trust and a kinship to him. And that's remarkable. Um, this, that's why this movie is unlike anything that you can find in the news. It doesn't matter how, how well-read you are uh, and how much poking around you do on the internet. Uh, nobody got as close to these guys as John got with the camera rolling while they were there. So uh, we, I feel, that's why I say I feel like with this movie we've got a national treasure and I feel like we've got to share it and get it out there. Um, this is something that people must see because these are our friends, our neighbors, and our family members who are over there and this is the cost that they're paying. The idea here was not to make an anti-war movie or as much as a pro-war movie, but to make a movie that says this is what war is and this is what war does. And now, take that home, discuss, think. Okay, so uh, I think I'll, I'll jump into, oh, one last thing that I should say too. Um, so, the, uh, when, when I first came onto this movie and um, got into uh, this 140 hours of footage to cut a feature film, uh, after a few weeks, I went into the president of the company and I said, there's too much footage here to squeeze into 90 minutes. It doesn't fit. It's not doing justice to the material. What we have is a series. Um, and so we went out and we, we cut a, a couple, about an hour's worth of, of the movie uh, as episodes. And we went out and we sold it as a, as a mini-series to HDNet, the um, cable channel, the HD channel. Um, and they ordered it as four one hours, like a mini series that they would play each, uh, one hour each week over the course of this past January. Um, so that's how the movie was cut. Um, for the Newport Beach Film Festival, what we've done is we've taken the first two episodes of the four episodes, we've pushed them together into one 100 minute feature length movie, uh, and that's what we're presenting at the festival. And it really does stand on its own, as its own movie, it, and it's got its own arc, and it's got its own sort of sense of completion to it. Um, although, the, absolutely, at the end of that, you know, of this first hundred minutes, you really want to see the next hundred minutes and sort of see where it goes from here and how it develops. And the the second half takes the men home, and then stay, and then comes back and revisits them some months after they've been home. And I actually was there for that filming. John and I went to their base. Uh, outside of Atlanta uh, and spend some time with the guys to check in with them and to see how you doing. Uh, and the PTSD issues come raging to the front uh, and that's really what the back half of the movie comes about. So, so what we're showing at the festival is really more about this counterinsurgency mission, getting to know these soldiers and, and all these things I've been talking about. Um, hopefully, ideally, there'll be a sufficient interest after the screening uh, day after tomorrow that we can soon thereafter set up a, another screening for the second half and come back and show um, parts three and four. Uh, so that's you know, something to be aware of as we, as we go into the festival. Um, and I think that's it. Oh, last thing I'll say is that Captain Thompson, the commanding officer of Baker Company, um, is going to be at the Newport Beach Film Festival. He's flying out from Fort Benning which is a really extraordinary opportunity to be able to dialogue with the guy who was responsible for this mission and responsible for getting these 350 men home safely, which he did. 
They went into this area expecting 50% casualties. Of the 350 men, they figured that about half of them weren't coming back. Uh, Captain Thompson brought every single one of those men home. Uh, large part of that, large part of that is because of who Captain Thompson is. And uh, when you see the film and when you meet him in person, you would follow this guy anywhere. Uh, so he's really, truly, I mean, it's a sort of worn out phrase, but if there's ever an American hero, this is the guy. So he's going to be there uh, to do a Q&A after the screening on Friday. Uh, another huge reason to be there and to tell friends and colleagues to be there. Uh, so that you can have that opportunity to, to talk with, with, uh, with Captain Thompson. Okay, so I'm going to play a little clip here. It's about five minutes long, and then um, we can jump in. It's a war on both ends. Let's, let's put it like that. It's a war on both ends. It's a war here and it's a war in, in your love life. Because the deployment is so long and you have to wait so long just to, to be able to feel that person, to be able to hug that person again. And knowing that it could end like that and you cannot see that person again. And there's been a lot of relationships broken because of it. Let's talk about long distance love and war. Don't do it. But I got a real good woman, a real good woman. And, you know, God has blessed me with a, a, a real good son as well. Hey, your loved one back in the States, you know, talking about, you know, she had an argument with somebody over the phone about paying a bill or something like that. You just don't have patience for that. You're like, whatever. Everything that happens back home, I kind of zoned out. And everything that's happening here, I just focused on. When I don't call because I'm having a bad day because they want to tell me about their problems, I just, I don't want to, I get fed up. I don't want to hear it. They don't understand that I, a bad day means a really bad day. It means a horrible day. A lot of these people are friends I went to school with, and I get to keep in touch with them on here and see pictures of everything they're doing back home. Sometimes you see pictures of friends, though, and you wish you were there. I used to say love knows no boundaries, but... I guess it did have a boundary, and it was Iraq. I love her to death. I love her everything, part of my heart, but it's just, you don't get to use that love out of here, so it's really hard to show her that you love her or tell her how much you love her on the phone. I called her on the phone, and she told me that the relationship was over, that she was leaving me. She wouldn't really give me that great of an explanation. She told me she couldn't do it anymore. She guided me through the dark. She was my strength. She was my rock. But unfortunately, you know, we, our relationship, our, not our love, our relationship wasn't strong enough to survive. Ten, twenty, thirty, five. 38,300? 38,300. Wow. You can help me recheck. This should be 10, 20, 30, 5, 37, 38, 38, 3. Here's how we pay these guys. Give the group leader 600 bucks. He's the guy who's in charge of all the guys at the checkpoints. Then he's allowed to have four managers. Each of those guys get $450. And then each worker gets 300 bucks. So you got to do the math and all that, and then he gets a, a little sum out of that. Yeah. It's more money than probably 60% of Americans make in a year. If this saves one kid getting shot, regardless of whether he's killed or just hurt, you know, it's, it's worth it. But then on another on another hand, you think to yourself, well, what if the home beat was never over here? Money and candy. All you need in this world right here, money and candy. All I know is, where I'm at right now, and this makes sense and seems to be working now. Um, which was going to my bank account, but fortunately it's going to uh, Shake Latif's. Yeah, I don't know. The, mon the money thing is, is crazy, and that was something I, I completely was not prepared for. 
I learned how to conduct raids, conduct ambushes, conduct reconnaissance missions. You know, no one ever told me about, you know, building a foreign internal defense. That was never a class I got. All right, today we have $28,500 today. You guys have earned it and you deserve it. And it, this, this money goes back into the community and will, will help a lot of people. And I remember when, you know, the, the ideas first came out that, hey, we're going to start recruiting locals to pull security on their own neighborhoods. We're going to put them at checkpoints, um, organize them, and start paying them. There was a lot of discussion about that. The proof is in the pudding, so to speak. The money has an effect and it is influencing behavior far more than, than any other weapon system we have. Okay, okay. do you want a bag for this? Um. I probably should have given you a little bit of context for what that second half is that you were just seeing. Um, Sheikh Latif, who came in and got the cash there, is a, a Sunni tribal leader in this region. Um, and uh, it, earlier in the film, one of the very first times that Sheikh Latif comes into the base with some of the other high-level sheikhs in the area, there's an army intelligence officer who leans over to the camera and says, that guy right there, and points at Latif, uh, well, we know that he's been having high-level Al-Qaeda meetings at his house. Um, and we're bringing him in to basically offer, you know, that we would like to buy his support away from Al-Qaeda. Um, so that's what's happening here, is we're paying the Sunni extremists who we were fighting just a couple months ago. Uh, now we're coming back with bundles and bundles of cash and essentially paying them to not shoot at us anymore. Um, and, you know, to pull duty for themselves. Um, so, uh, you know, and as uh, Captain Hemmen, who's the second in command, so he's not just any army guy, he's the, the one right underneath Captain Thompson, uh, talks about that, you know, sort of morally ambiguous issue about using this money, you know, what does it say about, like, why are we here in the first place, when the executive officer is asking that question? You know, the war's reached an interesting turning point, uh, but nobody can deny that it's working, like I said, you know, Went in there expecting 50% casualties, came home with everybody. Um, so, is this a good idea or not? You know, where does it leave you? Um, what does it do to the to the men who were there serving that mission? Um, you know, how does it play on their hearts and minds to be party to this kind of a of a tactic? Um, and you know, when you look forward at Afghanistan and what's happening there and where the war is going, this is the counterinsurgency that they're talking about when they talk about how we're fighting that war. Um, you know, the very next thing that happens in here, humanitarian mission, they go hand out water. Um, knowing that there's Al Qaeda everywhere in this village as they're handing out the water. Um, you know, essentially trying to outmaneuver Al Qaeda as to who's your, really your friend here, uh, you know, amongst the Iraqi people. So, um, there are any thoughts, questions, Anything that anybody wants to put forward at this point, I think we could, you know, open it up for discussion. Yes. I would imagine that um, once the money runs out, wouldn't they turn back the other way? Yeah, uh, it's a, it's kind of the question that this goes to, um, and uh, to, the closest thing to an answer that that we have really within the movie is uh, that. The idea was that the money would create space, uh, security, security for the Iraqi government to come in and establish a legitimate authority. Um, the, uh, the catch there is that the Iraqi government is a Shia-led government, uh, and the Sunni and the Shia were the you know have been fighting each other for thousands of years. So uh, you know one of the major sort of storylines in the film is a bridge that the Americans had bombed you know, a year ago, uh, and now they're coming back to build it, to rebuild it. Um, and so they build this bridge and it connects 
you know, two, two villages and creates passage for people to get food and water and supplies and all these things. But it also allows Al-Qaeda to go back and forth across the river and shuttle weapons and things like that. Uh, and the, once they build the bridge, the, uh, the bridge is turned over to the Iraqi army, um, the, the Shias, who, you know, are, really run the army. Uh, the Shias come in, the Americans hand over the bridge, and within weeks they're getting reports that the Shia are grafting all of the locals to use a bridge. Um, so, you know, this is the thing. You know, you, you can buy that space, but when you step out of the space, has anything fundamentally changed in Iraq? And it's a question that I don't know if any of us really have the answer. You know, time will tell us. I have the microphone. In a way, you addressed my question because the, the difference between the Sunni and the Shia, and we immediately went in and and said we weren't going to use the, the Sunnis in government or in their army or their police or anything. So naturally they would be, you know, you've shifted a whole, we've shifted a whole population of people into the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what is going to happen? Um, and right. do they give classes in that to um, the GIs before they go over? None whatsoever, <laughs> <laughs> which is really the thing. I mean, you know, these, these guys are, there was a, another clip that I considered playing. It's so hard to figure out which clips to play because there's, uh, there's so many nuances and, and so much of the things, the questions I'm sure you're having do get addressed in the film through the words of the soldiers. But these guys are trained to be killers. I, and they many of them really enjoy that part of the job, which is a bit alarming, you know, to hear how casually they talk about how much fun it is to let loose. Uh, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's shocking. Um, and, uh, and, you know, these are the kids who are now, and they're kids, you know, 19, 20 years old, uh, who are now going in and their job is now to be diplomats, social workers, um, amongst the same people who they were blowing up. So, you know, there's a really fascinating line when they go into, they recruit what's called Sons of Iraq, which was the local Sunni um, militias that they would assemble to pull duty of their own villages. And that's who the, this money is going to, is the Sons of Iraq. Uh, and there's a sign-up session for the, sol for the citizens to come and sign up and be part of Sons of Iraq and get paid their $100 a month to, you know, be part of this. Um, and um, one of the staff sergeants says, uh, you know, we were probably shooting at these people a couple weeks ago. We probably killed some of their family members. But here they are, you know, showing up. They want to get paid. So, and he says, I guess so. If we pay more than Al-Qaeda does, they'll play with us. He says, I still don't trust them, though. And he turns, and turns around to the other guy and goes, hey, you know, with a big smile on his face to the Iraqi, you know, gentleman who just showed up. So uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, this question calls for a little speculation. So after people see the movie, what do you think, what do they feel, and what do they feel like doing? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I think it depends on, on what uh, point of view the person brings into the movie. You know, I, like I said, I mean, we didn't make this film to, as an anti-war movie. We didn't want people to come out saying, you know, we never should have gone to Iraq, for instance. Uh, it's, everybody can come up with their own conclusion on that. Um, I think that what people will come away from is uh, understanding the, the intimate personal consequences of war on the people who have to go and fight it. Uh, and it's really easy to see soldiers as numbers um, or that you know, they're doing something for the greater good, uh, and, many, and they are you know, in many cases, and they believe they are. Uh, but to be able to get up close, to look in the eyes of a guy whose wife left him uh, because he's there uh, and hear him tell the story you know, you don't look at a headline the same way anymore. You talked about the uh, media being complicit in the lead up to the war. Do you think the same thing is going on with Iran right now? Because there are increasing numbers of, of media stories on Iran. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. Bill and I were talking about this just uh, during the break that, um, you know, every, uh, every news story comes with a point of view. And um, the important thing that we can do to remain informed is to collect various points of view. Um, I'm certain that the media would be doing that in Iran because the media does it with everything, including you know the kid who ran away from home and they report on. I mean, everything has a perspective on it. Everything's got an angle on it, uh, and uh, you know it's our responsibility to dig deeper. My question that. Uh, 
by the way, this looks very interesting. I want to see the whole thing. From your point of view as a director, in this movie you were shepherding it, you mentioned, but you've done others. As a director and a creative, on the creative side of it, what's, what kind of traits do you think you need or a director needs in order to be a director? And uh, the second part of the question, uh, what, what are the biggest challenges you face as being a director? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, it, you know, there's a, I'd say that the principal thing being a director of documentaries in particular is uh, to be a good listener. Um, you have to, to quiet the, your own voice in your head sometimes and really listen to what's being said to you. Or, uh, and you know, usually if you think, pay attention to this the next time you're having a conversation with somebody, that while they're talking to you, there's this voice going in your head preparing what you're gonna say when the person gives you the next opportunity to step in. Uh, and then you're not really 100% present for what the person is saying to you. And you learn to be very still in, when you're filming a documentary or in the editing room listening and it becomes sort of this intuitive exercise of finding the emotion. Um, you know, we are, we all sort of play detectives with the emotions, sort of, sort of piece it together and build this puzzle. Um, so you're, you're, when you start assembling this, this movie, I started trying to sort of find what were those emotional building blocks. Um, and, uh, you know, and the other thing on this film in particular that was really important as, as a director coming into it is, you're dealing with very sensitive material, and not just in the fact the subject of the war, but you know these men who just, as you can see, just spill it you know, on camera, um, and uh, and in doing so are running directly against the uh, the culture of the of the armed forces. Um, that you just don't do that. So we felt this huge burden, you know, to be faithful to these men and to uh, to uh, put forward what it was they were saying, uh, but to make sure that we were trying to do it in a way that was with as little subjectivity as possible. Um, a lot of times I come at documentaries with an, a point of view, an angle, you know? I'm trying to tell this story. This place is significant to the community because, you know, and you, and you line up your stories to make your case like a prosecutor. Uh, this one was different. Uh, this one was intentionally, as soon as we found ourselves doing that, we'd stop each other. And I wait a second, wait a second, you know, we need to step back. Let's find another point of view and put it next to that one so that you know, we can show both sides that you know, this guy still thinks 9-11 is you know, convinced that that's why they're here. And this guy is so far past it that you know, you just, your heart breaks for him. And let's put them, let's put them both there. You know? um, the, the biggest challenge, uh, very quickly, uh, on the documentaries really truly goes back to what I was saying at the top of this conversation. Making the movie is, is filled with challenges. It's a lot of fun. It's spiritually deeply rewarding. Uh, the process of getting the movies out there so that they have a nice long life um, is uh, really daunting and without a lot of, uh, of creative satisfaction. Um, and uh, trying to get people to care, to pay attention. You know, if, we could, if I could just show five minutes to the world, everybody would want to see the movie. Uh, but the world doesn't want to watch my five minutes. <laughs> and it's really frustrating. It's really do it takes huge amounts of patience. And again, the, especially in independent films, the budget doesn't provide for a year's worth of effort after the movie's done. So you do all of this stuff for free. While you're trying to earn a living, pouring your heart and soul into the next movie that you're working on. Uh, and it's, that's the biggest challenge, I think, for independent filmmakers. Getting the movie made in the first place, like getting the funding to make your movie is hugely difficult. Um, and, uh, but just as significantly getting the movie out there for the world to see. Um, when I'm, I'm reminded of a, a, poem, a story by Mark Twain called A War Prayer. Is there any possibility or any thought of doing something like this on the Iraqi side? Is, yeah. is that even remotely possible that we could begin to get that level of honesty if there's a cinematographer, yeah. an Iraqi cinematographer, photographer that could rise above it yeah. and maybe do something like that. Yeah. And is there a, a website or a, a posting a five minute thing that can, you know, be posted on YouTube or that we could spread around? Uh, yes. Two totally different questions. Right. The second one was for regarding Baker Boys. Yeah. Yes, there is. If you type in the Baker Boys inside the surge into uh, YouTube, 
you'll get the trailer and a couple of clips as well that we've put up there. And also there's the website, Baker Boys, bakerboysmovie.com, that also has all that stuff. Um, and uh, with the Iraq, I, I'm certain that there's probably somebody out there who's even doing it, you know? Um, and again, they're probably struggling to get their movie together and out and heard. There, you know, I did some fair amount of research on the Iraq documentaries. I mean, they're the sort of obvious ones that come to us, but then there are those that you gotta go out and search for. And there are uh, three or four uh, documentaries that I've seen that you can find if you, you know, start Googling the stuff um, that uh, do tell the story from the Iraqi side. One of them is, uh, uh, I can't remember the title of it, but it's it's essentially, you know, how jihadis, jihadists get created, you know, uh, and sort of starts with a family that wasn't in the beginning and then all these horrible things happen to them and they get pushed into extremism. Um, you know, they, they, are, they are out there. Um, yeah, so you, gotta, you gotta look for them. Um, hi. Uh, given the success of the Hurt Locker, has, uh, have, is that gonna, are you gonna have yeah. a lot more opportunity now? Are people calling you? Do you have? I, I you wouldn't know? say it's changed, the, it's turned the tide, uh, but it, uh, it has helped for us to use that as a, as a sort of a reference. You know, Hurt Locker's, it's the first time that there's been a lot of Iraq films done, documentaries and features, and none of them have done well at all. And we've had to fight against that, that uh, current uh, on this one. Um, well, Iraqi movies, you know, they just they just don't sell, and nobody sees them. And you know, yeah, we tried that; it didn't work. You know, you, you get we got that response from like everybody. Uh, and now with Hurt Locker, it's a little harder for them to make that argument. Um, even though, frankly, Hurt Locker didn't make very much money. You know, won a lot of Oscars, but it made like eleven million dollars or something. I mean, it probably lost money. Um, so, uh, but but it does help. It does help. I just wanted to know, have the people that you interviewed seen this movie and what were their reactions? Yeah, uh, thank you, it's a good one. Um, a handful of them ha we sent uh, early copies to uh, because they were featured in here and um, uh, pending their approval, we wanted them to help us in promoting the movie. Uh, and they were, uh, you know, really, also it aired on HDNet, so a group of them got to see it when, when it was airing on television, but not a lot of people have HDNet, so. Um, the response has been, uh, I would say 95% uh, extremely positive. Um, and then there are some people who feel like, uh, you know, we didn't tell enough of the whole story. Uh, we could have gotten other, more other points of view. Um, but on May 1st, the film is going to screen in its entirety in Iraq for Baker Company. Uh, and probably a few hundred other soldiers will be there. Uh, and this is going to be really interesting. And then I have a conference call with a whole bunch of them to hear what they thought. Uh, and it'll be really interesting to hear what they think. I think that the first half of the movie that deals with counterinsurgency and what it's like over there, I think it's hard for a soldier to watch that and not think that, like, yeah, they, they, that's pretty much how it goes. Um, when we get into the PTSD and we start profiling guys who come forward with their, their problems and are very candid and talking about it, uh, I think that sets some of the uh, soldiers on edge that they see their fellow guys doing that. Um, it's hard, I think, for them to really be okay with that. Uh, so I, I predict that there'll be some pushback on, on, on that. But that's a complex question as to why there's pushback. You know, I think there's a lot of different currents flowing through that. Um, aside from the uh, whole moral question about paying the Sunnis to not shoot at us, um, I'm wondering if, now these, the Baker boys have had both the uh, hard fighting and the counterinsurgency. What do do we have any data on, say, people in Afghanistan who have not done the hard fighting but are just counterinsurgency, and the rate of P PTSD? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it 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 could be that we're buying less PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I don't know. That's if we a have really it. good point. That's a really interesting way of putting it. Um, and I think you're you're probably right. Uh, yeah. You know, PTSD though it comes in, a, it comes from a lot of different places, and you don't necessarily just have to be shot at to to get it. Being in just being in that environment is highly stressful. Um, so, and again, I mean, I'm, I'm saying these things sort of secondhand, you know, but I'm getting a lot of this information. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting point. I think the less combat, then yeah, I think people probably come back a lot less damaged on the on the inside. You know, there's one 
uh, statistic that I think is really important for everybody to take away from this um, that I wasn't aware of until I started researching and, and putting this movie together. There have been more deaths of uh, soldiers um, by suicide, homicide, overdose at home than there have been in the, all of the years of Iraq and Afghanistan combined. And you don't hear about them. It doesn't make the front page. So it's really, you know. I'm getting the time card, so I guess this is our last question. Yeah, I got just a, when does the movie play? I, I looked in the schedule here, I didn't see it. Uh, it plays on Friday, day after tomorrow, uh, at 2.45 in the afternoon, which I know unfortunately is a difficult time for many people, but page 31, thank you. Uh, at the box office or through the NewportBeachFilmFest.com, uh, you can buy tickets online. Um, I don't predict it's going to sell out because of its time in mid-afternoon on a weekday. Uh, you probably just get tickets on the day. But if you want to get them in advance, NewportBeachFilmFest.com, and then just type in the search for the movie. And, and the venue? Oh, yes. It's uh, Edwards Island Cinema Theater 6, the one in Fashion Island. Yes, uh, we are uh, currently closing our DVD deal, uh, and when we have that deal done, then we can start doing a whole new wave of promotional effort. Um, and uh, if you go to bakerboysmovie.com, you can register there, and then we will send you updates that say, the DVD release is on such and such a date. It's playing at this festival, uh, and you'll get all of the information that there is to share. Great. Thank you again so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Hope to see you guys on Friday. Thank you.